Intelligence services and spies are unknown to the majority of the people who live on Earth. They're associated with larger-than-life telephone bugging, secret cameras, concealed microphones, and other things which are more at home in action movies. But how much truth and how many lies do we hear about intelligence services? How much are their actions concealed and cloaked in mystery now in the 21st century? In the era when protecting one's privacy has become such a controversial issue, we are entitled to ask whether these spies are still in action or not. Am I still being washed through the keyhole because of my country? Do they still carry out black ops that result in kidnapping and murder? In the Cold War era, the CIA organization had a very active presence in Latin American countries and supported the most formidable dictators. Now we go back in history and time to reveal and study the CIA interventions in Uruguay in the 60s and 70s and we'll try to find answers to the following question. Why is the central office of the U.S. Intelligence Ministry still operational in Uruguay? There are some answers to this. Nunca pensamos hacer socialismo por Uruguay. El comunismo estaba como ganando gran terreno. Y tan estúpidos no éramos. El Escuadrón de la Muerte, bueno, tuvo una, una actuación lamentable, detestable. Yo estaba con la cabeza puesta en la guillotina. No, no lo tocábamos al individuo, ¿no? Se asustó y cantó todo. Usted no me va a creer. Nardone fue durante ese gobierno el principal operador político de la CIA. Nuestra tarea era encontrarlo y divulgar que estaba allí. Mitrione enseñaba uh, a la represión. Central Intelligence Agency of the United States of America, which is commonly known as the CIA, is a governmental organization. Besides spying on other nations, this organization takes it incumbent upon itself to gather intelligence about organizations, individuals, or governments who might pose a risk to U.S. national security. This agency was founded in 1946 by the then President of the United States of America, Harry S. Truman, to replace the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, which was active during World War II. The establishment of the CIA was directly related to the consequences of World War II. Up until that time, the United States had not had the status in the global arena as it later achieved. I mean regarding the international power distribution. At that time, America was really worried about the incidents that were unraveling in Latin America. We are talking about the region of its direct influence and not just the things that were taking place across the Atlantic. After the war, the power shifts its balance. Now the United States has the upper hand over countries which were of great importance up to this point. For instance, Great Britain. One thing that contributed to its weakening was the military conflicts that it got involved in. The United States, on the other hand, had suffered less damage. This resulted in them reviewing their policies, including their intelligence services. In other words, before the Second World War, the United States did not have a central intelligence service. It did have scattered services which either belonged to the Defense Ministry or the State Department, but it lacked any organization that would centralize all these activities. Uruguay is a small country located in the southeastern part of South America, bounded by Brazil and Argentina on the shores of the Atlantic and the Silver River. It is home only to 3,250,000 people, but this has not stopped the U.S. from meddling in this country. 
In the Cold War era, a military dictatorship took the power in Uruguay, which severely suppressed the freedom of speech and other civil liberties. These conditions were fully planned and supported by the United States and the CIA played a very significant role in them. In the 60s and following the Cold War, propagated by the Soviet Union and the United States, a leftist partisan movement took roots in Uruguay, which was against American interests. In the middle of the 20th century, the Second World War shook the world. In this war, two opposing ideologies finally came to a head. The stimulus was the fight over power, which played out as a competition to occupy and annex other lands. The conflicts continued until 1945, and the world was then divided into two blocks. Capitalism, which was led by the United States of America, and communism headed by the Soviet Union. In 1946, when the world was at peace and the wounds of war still fresh, the CIA came to life. This organization greatly influenced the internal and foreign political movements that ensued. The birth of the CIA was no coincidence, and even at that time, not many people were told of its existence. At the same time, the Star and Eagle came to action. The CIA was created with the goal of stopping communism spread around the world. In this period, its greatest competitors were Russian KGB and East German Stasi. The CIA was not only actively taking part in espionage at this time, but was also involved in training rebels to instigators to weaken governments who were against the White House, such as the Cuban government. In Latin America, the Cold War was manifested as supporting social, political, military, and governmental movements. After an arduous journalistic effort, the producers of this program managed to contact a CIA operative active in Uruguay. What we will see is the reconstruction of an interview since we agreed with the CIA agents to take note of his conversations with our producer. He explained why Uruguay was of huge importance to America at that time. Uruguay has always been a geopolitical location for CIA. Here is supposed to become the spot for the central command for the region. This space has to deal with all the cases of the region which were previously handled from our embassy in Buenos Aires. There are four important agencies in this office. La DEA, Coast Guard, FBI and CIA. From this base, all the coordination for the region is made. Now this should be managed from Uruguay. The transfer of the base will take place at the end of this year or early next year at tops. I don't know. I don't know the main reasons behind this. But I assume that the U.S. has good relations with the U.K. and U.K. is now having issues with Argentina and that they want to keep their strong ties. If this relocation takes place effectively, all the activities of the agency with regard to the Latin American region will be managed from Montevideo. But the history of the CIA interventions in Uruguay does not start with and is not limited to this incident. This agency has had a very clear role in one of the most calamitous periods in the existence of the Uruguayan nation. The armed partisans and the last military dictatorship starting from 1973. In the following years, tens of people were abducted, tortured and killed. The CIA started its activity in Uruguay in the 40s. At that time, an organization was put up in Montevideo to lead espionage and counter-espionage activities and to influence adopted policies. Pretty much the same as what was done in other parts of the world except for Britain, Australia, Canada and New Zealand. The central commands are located in the capitals of the countries with other offshoots in nearby towns and provinces which operate under the central commands. In most cases, they operated under the pretext of the political divisions of the U.S. embassies. 
The goals of the bases revolved around collecting intelligence on military, scientific, economic and governmental activities with regard to the interests of the Soviet Union in the region. Support for the Soviets would come in the shapes of local communist groups, nationalist movements, fanatic revolutionaries and leftist parties. The CIA had many collaborators in Uruguay. One was Benito Nardone, the editor-in-chief of El Rural Daily and member of the National Party. This party is one of the oldest in Uruguay. In 1960, he managed to become the parliament speaker of the state council. Nardone, enjoying his relations with rural audience through CXF Radio Rural Channel, would unleash his harshly critical anti-communist rhetoric. This was picked by the CIA and they knew that in this rural leader, they had found a good operative to carry out their anti-communist plans. In 1958, Havert Hunt, a high-ranking CIA official, chose Nardone as the executive of political programs, a post which he held onto until 1963. He had to provide information and hold weekly meetings with Tom Flores, the manager of the radio station. This radio station in Montevideo was related to the CIA. It was physically put up in Montevideo in late 1940. It was in the same year that Chatul, a locale in Montevideo, came into existence. This perhaps has very close relations with the commencement of an era in Uruguay in which many political upheavals happened. The powerful presence of the democratic parties, the Liberal Party and their representatives and the absence of prosecution and bullying against the communists. This resulted in the Soviet Union and especially the Communist Party to find a focal point in South America. Apparently, the CIA also needed to take over this region, since communism, unlike other countries of the region, was not prosecuted here. Therefore, this place had become good ground for their activities. It was at this time that the CIA launched its facilities in Montevideo. The relation between Benito Nardani and the CIA was first made known when the first government of the National Party came into power. This party was a faction of the Ruralist Federal Coalition, which was in fact an offshoot of the Colorado Party. But it was in the late 1950s that it managed to make a political coalition with Luis Alberto de Herrera to form the government. With this measure, they managed to claim victory in the 1958 elections. In that government, Nardoni was the most important agent of the CIA. At this time, Nardoni was going about his political activities in a very casual manner. He was working in the National Council of the Government and his activities were in line with his job. He also had to direct his political activities in the same direction as was instructed by the government. In other words, he was taking orders from the CIA. This was in direct relations with prosecution and bullying of communist loyalists and the war against them. They tried to maintain as close a relation with oppressive and anti-communistic establishments of the government as possible. Well, Nardoni launched the most vehement anti-communism campaign that was ever seen in those years. He would constantly propagate his thoughts and beliefs through his newspaper and other facilities that were put at his service. He was among the first to provide stimulants for violent activities in Uruguay of those years. That's why the leftist parties were dubbed the group of fascists in those years. Between the 60s and the 80s, social unrest, breach of human rights and oppressive tactics were rampant in Latin American countries. Cold War was defined by military regimes and in South America, Uruguay proved to be no exception. Abduction, imprisonment and murder at the hands of armed forces and civilians were usual occurrences. Uruguay was a real time bomb. Apart from the armed forces, another key player in this chaotic situation was Tupamaros, the national liberal movement. They were a hardline leftist group which came to existence in the 60s under the direct influence of the 1959 Cuban Revolution. 
From early on, the organization was introduced as socialist and enjoyed limited foreign support from Cuba and other partisan movements in neighboring countries. MLN is still following the same goals as it first did. Collaboration? We've never thought about it. For that reason, they treated us very unfairly. It was never our intention to start socialism in Uruguay. We weren't that stupid. Uruguay is a worthless speck. In terms of population, it's on par with one of San Paolo's regions. No. Participating in construction? There was no plan and no development in the society. This was the origins of MLN and with no goals. We had one difference with the Communist Party. Communist parties would program on global scales. The basic difference between socialist countries and capitalist nations was capitalism. We never had any mutual thesis and grounds. We were saying that the real and basic scale of comparison in our era was the countries which were called developed, developing or industrialized. In fact, this was the distinction. I imagine, in fact, we're not the only people who think like this. History showed that we were not that wrong either. Although socialist tendencies are now a thing of the past, but the distinctions are still present. We had acquired this intelligence. Mitrione encouraged suppression. It was the same in Dominican Republic and in Brazil. Who was the master of this? His supporters would say that his activities were scientific and that he wouldn't torture out of sadism. After you'd give him what he wanted, he'd leave you alone and wouldn't bother you anymore. Well, isn't that the very aim of torture? There was a relation with the Cubans. We'd provide them with services and they'd provide us with some services. We did have some stuff, but very little. But we never had any ties with the Soviet Union. We and the Soviet Union? Let me put it this way. When they came to us, apart from Cuba, none of the Topamares members were in the socialist countries. Most important incidents took place in the mid-50s. It was in the early 60s when the ex-president of Guatemala, Jacobo Arbenz, sought asylum from Uruguay. He was ousted by political dissidents who were directly funded and supported by the CIA. They feared that Arbenz would champion a popular nationalism in Guatemala. They accused him of having very close ties with the Soviet government. And with this pretext, they interfered in that country's affairs and ousted Arbenz. This is but a very small example of the CIA interference in the countries of the region. The emergence of the socialist governments or its affiliates in these countries were probable, and also they feared large masses of people would come in direct contact with their ideology. The main activity of the CIA has been espionage, which we are all familiar with, more or less. It had a very significant goal, and that was conquering the public opinion. Thus, it would provide newspapers with funds and had journalists on its payroll. It would write the editorials and hand them down to papers and other media and so on and so forth. But this was the first time that we encountered such an issue in Uruguay. The case of Dan Mitrione was perhaps the most significant one regarding the presence of the CIA in Uruguay. He was a secret agent of the United States who worked as one of the U.S. Embassy staff in Uruguay. He was one of the agency's employees in the International Development Division. In spite of his cautious personality, his secret was disclosed. Dan Anthony Mitrione was a torture specialist. The CIA had sent him to Uruguay to carry out a secret program that was planned for the entire Latin American region. The agency's goal was to destroy the leftist who had mightily entered the scene after Fidel Castro's ascension to power in Cuba. The Uruguayan government had no knowledge of this intelligence agency due to the fact that everything was done clandestinely. This house that does not by any means stand out in this neighborhood witnessed the fate of Mitrione at the hands of Tupamaros. This is the famed Prison of the Nation. 
On July 30, 1970, Mitriona, along with Brazil's council, Aloisio Maresh Dias Comidech, was abducted by Tupamaros. A few days later, an American marshal, Claude Fly, was nabbed as well. They were all taken to the prison of the nation. Tupamaros would take its prisoners right to the heart of the Montevideo. They demanded the release of political prisoners in return for Mitriona's. Uruguay's government rejected their demand and as a result, Mitrione was executed on the 10th of August the same year. Brazilian consul Dias Comidas was released on the 21st of February after paying the ransom, but Fly passed away after having a heart attack on March the 2nd. We didn't have much intelligence, but we were informed of some of the issues via a Cuban agent. He was the famed Julieta, whose passport number was 13333. He had infiltrated the CIA and they had deployed him to Uruguay. This coincided with Mitrione's case. This way we received some information which was not much. We did not own an intelligence service to gather information through which. As I mentioned, you doubt what techniques they use in their works, but you don't even have to doubt. What I'm trying to say is that they would make many things up themselves. Many things were made up. Well, we know that when there is a possibility to eliminate organizations and people who run the country ineffectively, well, then we eliminate them. In 1972, Tupamaro subducted another person with the conviction of cooperating with the CIA in Uruguay. He was a police personnel named Nelson Bardesio. He was interrogated by Maurizio Rosenkov, a high-ranking MLN executive. His comrades would simply call him the Russian. Nelson Bardesio was an integrant of the CIA. Nelson Bardicio was the member of the CIA and the death squad in Uruguay. He was basically a person who was active covertly in the late 70s. In the late 60s and early 70s, the conduct and techniques of the death squad was despicable. Nelson Bardesio was a second-ranking staff of the police department. He was taking direct orders from the CIA and U.S. agents. It's very clear that he was not a simple photographer. He was way more than that. That's why he was well protected. Julieta knew this very well. It was him who informed us. And that's why we captured the guy. We didn't even touch him. He got terrified and disclosed everything. He explained everything, and that's how we came to know the matters, because he told us everything. We started chatting, and since his confessions were lies, I confronted him that he was giving us false information. I showed a photo of him and another person. I mean Miguel Sofia, who was a member of the death squad, who is still alive and at large. That was when he realized that I knew a lot. So you knew. I told him, why should we deceive ourselves? That's when he accepted and started talking. He took a notebook and started writing and wrote all that he knew. to find answers to the following question. Why is the central office of the U.S. Intelligence Ministry still operational in Uruguay? There are some answers to this.
El Escuadrón de la Muerte, bueno, tuvo una, una actuación lamentable, detestable. Yo estaba con la cabeza puesta en la guillotina. No, no lo tocamos al individuo, ¿no? Se asustó y cantó todo. Usted no me va a creer. Nardone fue durante ese gobierno el principal operador político de la CIA. Nuestra tarea era encontrarlo y divulgar que estaba allí. Mitrione enseñaba a, a la represión. Central Intelligence Agency of the United States of America to ask whether these spies are still in action or not. Am I still being washed through the keyhole because of my country? Do they still carry out black ops that result in kidnapping and murder? In the Cold War era, the CIA organization had a very active presence in Latin American countries and supported the most formidable dictators. Now we go back in history and time to reveal and study the CIA interventions in Uruguay in the 60s and 70s and we'll try... Intelligence services and spies are unknown to the majority of the people who live on Earth. They're associated with larger-than-life telephone bugging, secret cameras, concealed microphones, and other things which are more at home in action movies. But how much truth and how many lies do we hear about intelligence services? How much are their actions concealed and cloaked in mystery now in the 21st century? In the era when protecting one's privacy has become such a controversial issue, we are entitled...